Uh, I'm going to share a children's story before I thank you the, for being here. So it's kind of weird because there's no kids. Oh, well, there's two at the back. Oh, oh more on the other side. There's my kids. And there's you guys. Um, good to see you. I don't know if I can put the, if you can put the projection thingy going. Uh, excellent. Um, let me have a look if this works. Oh, awesome. So I'll share a children's story uh, for those children who are here and those who are in the hall. Uh, the question that I have for you children, and obviously I cannot see you. It's quite detrimental to my mind to think that I can't see you. But, <laughs> but um, just think about the questions that I'm going to ask you. And the question is, have you ever had anybody in your family who you do not like? <laughs> Some of you might be thinking, I don't even like myself, let alone anybody else. Uh, and, and so, children, you know, I, 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 as a child, you know, I know that I have my favorite uncle. I'm assuming you have a favorite uncle. Uh, if you have more than one uncle and they are here, don't tell them because they might feel sad. But uh, you will have a favorite uncle, a favorite auntie, uh, maybe a favorite cousin or a couple of them. And, and when I was a child, I also had favorite people. And so as I think about favorite people, I also think about family. And as I think about family, I think I was about this idea of a family tree. Uh, those children who are here, maybe in the hall, put your hand up. I'm sure your parents will see you. I can't, but uh, have you ever done a family tree? Yeah, I see. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Adults are doing it too. <laughs> okay, so a couple of children. Have, what about adults? Have you done a family tree? Yeah? Good, good. All right, so we all like to do family trees, and we can get, uh, well, not all of us, but some of us are more invested than others. A while back, um, I don't know how many years back, but we were doing this, one of those tr trips that we tend to do as I go back home. For those of you who do not know me, you don't have to know me. I'm from Mexico, so I go through a few places before I can go home and in the way back. And we were doing this touring around the um, west coast of America, and we were kind of like more inland from Las Vegas. We went higher up, and we were going, I wanted to go to Utah. Utah, children, is a big state. And there is a big lake called, well, they call it Lake City. Uh, because apparently there's a lake that is full of salt. Oh, no. Anyhow, so I wanted to do that because, lake, because Utah has a massive library sponsored by, the, by a denomination, a religion called the LDS. Children, do you know who the LDS are? Ask your parents. So, well, <laughs> oh, somebody does. <laughs> That is the, the Latter-day Saints, the Mormons. So they have this massive thing because of the, the religious belief of, of whatever kind. They, they have this massive library of ancestry. Anyhow, snow didn't let us go up, so we had to cut through, and we didn't end up going. But uh, my wife has always been interested in her ancestry as well, and even before I met her, she was trying to find out where she comes from, especially because she had to flee from the war in... in in, 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 the Eastern, in Eastern Europe, in Croatia, and Serbians, and all that kind of stuff. And so one day, I decided to give her a, a gift. Children, do you like gifts? You do? The big child behind me likes gifts. All right, excellent. So I thought, what am I going to give her? What am I going to give her? Uh, I was going to give her, I think it was our anniversary um, present. I don't remember what year it was, maybe 10, maybe 15. How many years? It's a while back now, I think. Anyhow... And so I knew she always wanted to know where she comes from. And so I gave her, I bought a little genetics kit, genes, where you actually get a little kit and you send it to a lab in Texas, and then they tell you where you're coming from. Now, don't take it that serious. The reality is that uh, it is as good as how many people are getting tests done with them, it's, we, I just took it as a fun thing, but my, I decided to do the same thing. Now, I'm not going to show you. I'm going to show you pictures, not of my wife, because I don't think it will be nice to put her here vulnerably in front of people. I don't think she'll mind, but, um, but I did the same. So I bought one for her, one for myself. My children don't need to, because if they know myself and my wife, they obviously will know where they come from. That makes it a little bit easier. And so I found out something surprising. 
And, and, and so some things are not so surprising, some things are. Let me share with you. So I, find, I found out that a large part of me comes from, let me show you this, comes from this place, I hope that you're looking at there in the hall, called the North Americas. That's not a fancy thing to think. I'm from Mexico, so that area is kind of like makes sense. But the thing that, and, and then there is a little yellow part in Central America, of course, in red, that's in there. That makes sense that I will be kind of like genetically uh, made up from that region. One thing that is interesting is that I have a couple of things that I never thought of. Now, let me first show the obvious. Kids, I don't know if you know where Mexico is, and I don't know if you know how Mexicans came to be. But let me share with you that Mexicans came to be as we know them as Mexicans because the Spanish people came and kind of like killed a lot of people and then they mingled together and then there is Mexicans. Kind of like what Australians did from England in here. Except, <laughs> except there is still probably more mixed Mexicans than there is the Aboriginal and Australian mixes here. Anyhow, I don't want to be politically correct or incorrect, I'm just mentioning the facts. But the fact that I have part of me from that area in Europe is not a surprise either. And then the fact that I have this part is what surprised me. I have part of me uh, to be African. I thought that was pretty cool. I thought that was pretty cool. And then there is a part of me that is in here, and you know, the test in itself says that I'm kind of like part Siberian or something, which is kind of interesting as well. So that's what it says. It says that I'm 49% from the Americas, no surprise. It says that I'm 41% European. 8% African, and then as the, as the time goes by, they change depending on how many people are testing, which is what I said. That changed to 7%, and so it looks like kind of like that's my genetic makeup. The interesting thing in here is when you look at it, is um, that I have the European parts didn't surprise me at all, but what did, oh, why did that keep on doing that? I, it must be me, not the computer. Whenever computers go wrong, it's usually human error, not, not the computer, so it's me. Uh, what, <laughs> what surprised me here is that I knew that a European would be part of my line. I have great-grandparents who are from Spain. However, what surprised me is that I'm from the British island, or I have part of me apparently, and Iberia. Well, Iberia is kind of like there. And then this, I thought that that was pretty cool to think that I have, according to this, 8% Jewish. I don't know if that's true or not. Anyhow, it's fun to see. It's fun to know. Now, this is the thing, ch children. Have you ever, I mentioned this, as I looked at the family line, I'm sure that there is some people who are racist and think like, oh, I don't really have anything to do with that race. I don't think I have anything to do with that family. And let's forget about race for now. Let's think about that uncle that is so annoying. <laughs> or that auntie that is quite annoying. Or the brother or the sister or the, or the nephew or the niece. We all have a family member who we don't like. We all have a family member who we don't appreciate. When you look at this, there are people in our family who we know something about. There is people who we do not know much about. And then there is people that we don't want to know about. <laughs> like that annoying whatever that is that you're thinking of. Now, I do think that we all have somebody there who we kind of like disown because we don't want to believe that they are part of our tree line and nobody wants to hear about them. But today, what I would like to present to you kids is that it doesn't matter if you have an annoying uncle or an annoying auntie or an annoying nephew or niece. God loves them all and he can change them all and he can change you so that you are not as annoying as they are. So today, what we're going to talk is about epigenetics. What I want you to listen is about what the message is in terms of epigenetics and what impact this might have with you in your life, as well as your mom and dad, and your brother, and your sister, and your cousin, and your uncle, and your everybody who is in your family line. With that in mind, though, I think it would be very good if we can have a word of prayer. If you are there, and you are very young because you are kids, I'll forgive you because you have instruments. But let's kneel down so that we can have a word of prayer together. Our Father in heaven, thank you for the opportunity to be able to, to think about family. 
to think about where we come from, to think about maybe the impact that it can have. But Father, we pray and we thank you because we know that we are part ultimately of your family. And we pray that as our Father who is in heaven uh, is looking after us and for us, we pray that you help us so that we can be uh, not as annoying on those people around us, but be more like you. In this we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. We got a scripture reading this morning. If you can open your Bibles in the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 1. Some of you might know that by memory. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Are we there? Yes. He says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Uh, I would like to, um, <clears throat> to send a greeting to everybody who is in the hall, as Andres mentioned before, watching live as well as those people who might be watching the recording. I'm sure that some of you might be, hey, you know, I'm going to catch up on that. So for those of you who do not know me, I guess these days you don't know who is watching. My name is Dan. Um, it's really Daniel, Banos, Elan. It's too long to remember. Dan will be sufficient. Uh, it's great that you can join us here and listen a little bit about something that is probably not your regular uh, preaching sermon. Oh, that's the way I see it anyway. I'm not a theologian. Uh, and so I will not claim to be able to divide the Word of God so skillfully like some of you can. Uh, I'm not retired either to be spending my whole day uh, reading the Bible like some of you might be able to. But I do love the Word of God. And I do love to dissect it as much as I can. But today we'll talk a little bit more about some science stuff, maybe at least at the beginning. And mostly to do with my area of Oh, I shouldn't say expertise because I don't think I'm an expert in many things or at all in anything. Uh, in my area of, of knowledge, a little bit more than in other areas that I have in my life. Before we do that, though, uh, I would like us to have a word of prayer again. I know we did, but uh, just for my sake, uh, I think it's important for us to keep on trying to uh, get God to talk to us. Uh, Father, um, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. We, we, we cannot thank you enough, really, especially after what we will see today. Father, we praise your name for allowing us to be here in freedom. Coronavirus or no coronavirus, you are where we are here in the church in Hinkler in Vandenberg, as well as with those people who listen to this recording where, where they might be. Father, I pray for everyone who listens to these words, that it may be a message that touches their mind in such a way that they, it's, it's never been before. Father, you can do that. No, no human entity can. So as we think about who will minister to us, we pray that it will be your Holy Spirit who does that. That your angels who, that excel in might and strength be the one talking to our minds as, as commanded by the Holy Spirit. And that any powers of darkness, anything that doesn't belong before your presence anymore may be swept away except us. Some of us might be bringing things that are not necessary to be brought into this place, and we pray that you forgive us so that we can also be touched by you. In this we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, epigenetics and genes. Uh, I'll, I'll want some feedback from you because this I see, like I mentioned before, I see this more of a lecture, more than an actual sermon, although it might end up being a sermon. I don't know. Who here have, has heard the word epigenetics. Okay, good. So my, a good number of you has, has heard the word. I'm assuming more people. Are. Let, let's do a bit of a, 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 a poll. Who has heard the word genes? Okay, a lot more people have heard the, has heard the word genes. So I entitled, I titled this, uh, this service, this sermon, this presentation, this lecture, epigenetics versus gene unto the third and fourth generation. Now let me make sure that I set up my thing in here well. Okay, excellent. And so what is epigenetics? The National Library of Medicine of the United States of America says that epigenetics refers to when the DNA is modified not to change. This is so important because evolutionary studies 
And if you're sitting here, I'm assuming you don't agree with such studies. And if you don't agree with such studies, good on you for not agreeing with such perplexity and nonsense. But epigenetics say that we cannot modify our genes because if you, the, the chain of our genes, because if you modify the chain of your genes, you, become, become, you, you start becoming mutants. And if you become a mutant, you become an X-Men. And X-Men don't exist. That's in, only in the movies. So what does happen, though, is that there can be an effect of change in the genes, but not the order. Because if we change the order, you might become a cat or a dog or something like that. The other thing that we know about epigenetics is, is that, it change, that it determines whether genes are turned on or off. And that can influence the production of proteins in the cells, ensuring only necessary proteins are produced. That's interesting. Usually most people who speak about this, this topic, they usually speak about the idea that we have switches in our genetic makeup. And so imagine that this is, this, this, we have these 10 genes or, or, or gen genetic components in, in, our, in our body, and to keep it simple, and, and, and some of them are actually on and some of them are off. Now, I know some of you have big concern about signs and symbols. I'm not trying to do any signs and symbols. I'm just forgive me. It's just, uh, I'll try to do my best not to do those ones that most people know are bad. Uh, so, so the ones that are on, remember, there's 10 genes, but only one, two, three, four. I don't know how to count. And, and two here, that's, that's six, are on. The other, that's six, that's four. So four of them are off. What epigenetics tells us is that certain things can activate certain genes and all of a sudden, oh, whatever, you know, one. so all of a sudden we have more than we used to have before. Let's imagine I'm going to put uh, this one so that people, there, one more activated. But the same thing can happen on the opposite side. So what that, ha what that means is that maybe this gene that was activated got deactivated and all of a sudden we are back to six, but this is a different gene. So what happens is that in your cells, in your body, things get modified, and the second sentence says that it's about proteins. The proteins change in the production of proteins. So if one, pro if one cell and its protein changes, so let's imagine that there is a cell that has these eight genes, and all of a sudden something happens, and all of a sudden this one goes down, now we have seven, so if that cell manages to survive and, and divide, and that's a special name for that process, don't worry about that, then it becomes two cells with eight, and then if those two become uh, prominent and survive, and don't get killed by cancer cells and free radicals and all those things that are not good for our bodies, then they multiply again, and all of a sudden from two, now you have eight, and if they divide the eight, they become 16, and they can become more prominent. So all of a sudden, that protein that was produced, the new one, becomes more relevant in your body. That's what epigenetics is. Uh, I hope that I'm not confusing you too much. I'm trying to explain it as simple as I can. It, it's, it's not that complex, uh, I think. Basically, we can modify certain components of our genetic production, the activity of our genes. You might be thinking, I came to church, I didn't come to the National Library of Medicine or to the School of Medicine or to any faculty of university. Why are you talking about that then? Well, allow me to explain, allow me to propose that there is an important thing related to genetics. Since I started studying human behavior, which is my, my, my area of, of work, my specialty, if you want to call it, uh, it's been, even before I study, uh, a very important uh, um, uh, curiosity of the human mind to find out why people behave the way they behave. I remember since I was little, I would go to the shopping centers where I grew up in Mexico, big shopping centers, and I would like to sit there on a bench and literally just look at people passing by. <laughs> just check out what they're doing. That's exactly what I will do. I'm, assume, I'm, I'm sure some of you have done that, or maybe still do, except I took it seriously and <laughs> make, it, make a living out of that. <laughs> but some of you just like, still like to be, keep watching people. So, so I, I used to love going to big camp. My wife is my witness. We used to get, uh, I, I don't go to, I haven't been in big camp for so long, uh, for personal reasons. But we used to come to the big camp and we used to take always this corner spot 
close to the toilet block. We had little kids, they were babies. And, and also, uh, it was fortunately and unfortunately, it was close to the, um, to the teen's tent. No, not close, but it was, it was in passage to the teen's tent. If you have been a big camp and you know what the teen tent is, you know what I'm talking about. And maybe you are resonate with the fortunate and unfortunate comment. The unfortunate comment is that I couldn't sleep when I wanted to go to sleep early because the services go a little bit later and they are not quiet. Um, and then, again, today is not a service about music, so we're not going to go there. But I wish that they didn't have that. One of the reasons why we don't go there. Anyhow, we move on. Can we edit that out? No, I'm kidding. Done. I stand for what I say. The second thing is, the second thing is that, the, the good thing is that children will pass by and they always had to go through the corner where we were. They always had to. Like there was, there was probably other way, but it was a long way around, so they never did. And we used to have this big lantern, a camping lantern, those dual mantle lanterns. We lit up the thing. I would sit, we all sit with our friends or whoever, and family sit there. Just watch the kids coming after the service, before the service. And it was so lovely to see, you know, the usual classic, the boy touching the, um, the hand of the girl and vice versa. They're not holding hands. They're just like, kind of like, just one millimeter touch, like kind of like giving a message to somebody else, to the person next to them. It wasn't long, maybe next day you'll see them that that thing became like a holding hand. And I always was puzzled about why people do that. I mean, we know why they do that. It's no, no, no uh, scientific need to, to know why people are doing that. But what these people have done, and I'm having here on the screen a couple of journals, is that from the beginning of when we have, as, as far as we have known, we have been interested in knowing what people do, what they do, human behavior. And so when people think about criminality, for example, I used to work in jails and see people when they became criminal, they think about, I think this person cannot change because they were born like that. That's the idea of nature. Nature making you a criminal. What well, hope can a criminal have if that's the case? We might as well jail everybody. Right? The other idea, though, some people come and say, no, 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 that's rubbish. It's actually because the poor guy, you know, he was violated when he was a child. There was domestic violence. The family separated, low socioeconomical status, uh, whatever, intellectual impairment, all sorts of environmental things after he had an ABI or a brain injury, and therefore he became a criminal. That's the nurture aspect. And so there is always this hot question between, do they, are they made or are they born like that? Today we know that we cannot simplify that easy. There is, a, there is a more complexity. There is a combination of factors. We cannot just say one or the other. And how do we know that? I can tell you. I have seen people who, uh, we, well, there is a study actually, somewhere there is a study somewhere there, of, 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 of um, uh, twin, twin studies where the same person is a criminal and the other one isn't. How can that be? How can that be? Equally, there is people who have had the toughest of lives, and how come they're not criminals? How come they are not going the way the other person has gone? So today, for the distracted one, for the like, for the one, ooh, for the one who likes to sleep, like I don't like to sleep in sermons, but sometimes I find it hard to concentrate. So if you are like me, that's all you need to know. From the beginning, three points that we're going to unpack. Number one. Genetics strongly influences you. Number two, epigenetics. This is the wild statement. This is where some of you might be prepared with your Bibles to throw in at me. Don't do that. It's the Word of God. But epigenetics is part of God's biological plan for eternal life. And I don't know if you have heard this in these words, in this shape. If you haven't, well, welcome to the club. I'm hoping to be able to convince you. I'm hoping the Holy Spirit convinced you that this is indeed something that God left and built in us as part of his plan of salvation. Number three, epigenetics actually can go beyond genetics and past learning. So epigenetics, genetics, the genetics strongly influences you. Go me, come with me to the Bible because I guess you think like, oh, he already talked too much and we haven't even opened the Bible. Uh, let's go and, and, and go to the book of Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter, uh, chapter 8, pardon me, chapter 8, and we're going to read verses 5 to, 
Ah, it says eight in there, but I wonder if I want to read more. Yeah, let's do eight, five to eight. It says, for those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit, for to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, just flip your page, I'm guessing, in your mind, that's how it goes, to chapter 7. We'll read verse 21 to 24. 21 to 24. I'm reading from the New King James Version. It says, I, fi I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who whose will is to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Oh, wretch man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Wow. It is an interesting thing. What Paul is saying in the first passage that we read, and I realize that it's after the one that we read uh, uh, after, so kind of like I switched the order, is that, hey, you know, we have to live by the Spirit. We cannot live by the flesh. What that means is quite, we cannot go and do what we desire to do in our inner bodies. In whatever your mind tells you, it has to go through a filter, a spiritual filter, because otherwise we're going to mess up. Indeed, what Paul said before that is that, you know what? I have this struggle. It's funny because I show you those articles of geneticists, behavioral people, psychologists, psychiatrists talking, why are people doing the things that they do? Why do we behave wrongly, badly? Why are we not nice people anymore? And what Paul is saying, I know what that is like. I indeed have a struggle in myself. I find myself having this tug of war between trying to do what is right and trying to, to, to do what I want to do what it pleases me to do, what Paul is saying, my genetics call me to do the wrong thing, but God call me, calls me to do something different. We have to remember who Paul is, for those of you who've never heard about this guy, some of you might, but I'm sure that maybe some of you are, haven't, we don't know who is going to be listening to this. But the reality is that uh, Paul is somebody who is well-educated, He's, uh, he's got a doctorate in law. He's part of the cabinet of government of his time, the Jewish nation. And he's saying, you know, um, it, it doesn't matter how much I have. I know that I actually struggle to follow what God wants me to do. It doesn't matter. It didn't matter how nicely he clothed himself. Being a member of the cabinet and having trained in the Gamaliel's feet will imply that he was like, kind of like going to the Harvard University of his time, which means he wasn't poor unless he got a scholarship. I doubt it. Jewish are not... <laughs> I shouldn't talk about Jewish. But <laughs> I doubt it. He, had, he was born into this right. I said it, I don't think I've said it here in this church, but in my church I've said it before. For you to be pleased, for, for God to be pleased with you in the Jewish, Jewish nation, there were three elements that needed to take place. First, you had to be a Jew. If you were not a Jew, you're, you're already doomed. Number two, you had to be a healthy Jew. That's the reason why people always thought about, hey, who sinned first, his mom or his dad? And that's the reason why it's blind. Obviously, God came to say, like, you know, that's rubbish. But you have to be a Jew and you have to be healthy. If you were not healthy, for those of you who have high blood pressures and heart conditions and neurological conditions and mental health issues and back issues, I have back issues and knee issues because of all sorts of things that I have done in my younger life, that means that I'm not really at good at peace with God because God is not blessing me with health. That's the Jewish mindset. And three, you have to be wealthy. So you know a Jew, healthy and wealthy, you are not blessed by God, and so God must be damning you for not being a good guy or a good girl. So Paul will have been selected for his status. But Paul, regardless of how educated he was, and regardless of how nice his clothes were, and regardless of what position he had in cabinet, in parliament, was a murderer. He was a killer. Killer and murderer, by the way, are different things. Anyhow, we won't go there. He wasn't just men slotting. 
He was actually purposefully, intentionally, and deviously going out there to kill people according to his idea. Now, we won't get into this idea that he was thinking that he was doing the right thing. That's another service. That's another sermon. Maybe one day I'll come and talk about that. Maybe you already know that anyways. We're talking in here that he had this tendency to follow his desire. And interestingly enough, as he shared this story, and we read it in, in Romans 7, he says, like, I am messed up. I am messed up. And then he cries out, who can rescue me from being messed up? Paul recognized that he was messed up. Do you recognize that you're messed up? Some of you might be sitting here, no, I've been here in church forever. I'm a fourth generation Seventh-day Adventist. I'm a seventh generation Christian. We are messed up, and so are you. So was Paul. There is no pedigree. Interestingly enough, talking to different people, if you want to go to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 to 10, as Paul gives this narrative to other people, obviously they were struggling with certain things. That the Corinthians, uh, he, he shares a couple of ideas. And he says this, Do you not know, which means, aren't you aware that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. He's like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, we all knew that. Ah, but what does that mean? And he, say, he gives a list of things. Well, do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And some of you might be sitting here, phew, none of that applies to me. I've been sitting here forever. But that list is not extensive. It goes beyond. That's just an example of what was happening at the time. I'm wondering, what is happening in the Hinkler Seventh-day Adventist Church? Is there backstabbing? Is there unhappiness because the carpet wasn't selected? The color I wanted it in my business meeting, in a nominating committee. They didn't elect me to be the elder, the priest, the pastor, the whatever I wanted to be. Is there something happening here? The list continues beyond. And that is because of the genetic makeup we have, because we have this tendency to desire the way that we want to be. We are pulled, we are warring against the way we are, we are built. We come back to that idea, and I probably have to speed up. Oh, it tells me I'm here 11 minutes, so that's okay. Um, and, and the idea here is, I, I mentioned it in a children's story, it's probably more of a big people's story. It was kind of hard to give a children's story with no little kids in front of you. It's a bit easier. Anyhow, but I presented to you this light. And the idea here is, are there people out there who are in your family who you wish they were never in your family line above you or along you or beneath you? If you are anything like normal like me, I think I'm a very average person, I think that you will have the same problem. Because sometimes we have parents or grandparents that we do not choose. And sometimes we don't want to remember they even were there. Some of us don't want to even mention them. Some of us like to even adjudicate to ourselves people that are not even in your family. Oh yeah, that's my cousin, magistrate, something, justice of the peace of whatever, of some Supreme Court. And how do you relate to me? Ah, oh, that's the cousin of my cousin or the nephew of my auntie who died years ago who I never met. Because we like to look like we are okay. Because we like to attribute to ourselves things that don't even exist for you. Because we like to look good. Because we are ashamed of the past that we have and the things that are in us. If you feel like that, good. Because what you're feeling is what Paul is saying, you know, I am ashamed of all the wickedness that my family did. Don't feel bad about it. From my dad's side, many people are in dirty politics. Womanizers, people connected to drug dealing, witches, and even a warlock. You see, my great-grandfather had this demonic ability to transform himself into an animal and go and make some nasty stuff to people he hated. Or people will pay him to do that. Those of you who have lived sheltered in Australia will think, that's crazy, that doesn't happen. Where I come from, that happens. And if you have lived in a different country, like an island, or Africa perhaps, or Latin America, you will know that witchcraft 
and demonic stuff is very real. From my mom's side, there are sexual deviants, pagans, idolaters, drunkards, drug addicted, and, and, and seekers of natural carnal pleasures. What about your family? What about your family? Who are those who maybe on the, ins the outside look nice, but on the inside you know? Who are those who come to church and sit in here, but when you go home you see what the real deal is? Who are those who are warring with this carnal uh, pulling, this force of nature, of genetics? The, the reality is that we're all doomed. The question is, is there an answer for our problems? Is there an answer for our problem? Is there an answer for me who has all this bad family line trickling down to who I am today? Question number two. Point number two. Epigenetics is part of God's biological plan for eternal life. You see, God didn't only make us with genes, He made us with the capacity to modify such genes. After the fall, things changed. If we didn't have capacity, I'm here daring to say as a scientist that we, will have, we would have no chance to be saved. What I'm here to propose today is that this ability to modify the way the genetic code is read, the ability to turn off certain things and turn on certain things, was built in the cellul at the cellular level in every little tiny cell in your body to prepare you for eternal life. How do I know that? Let's do a case study very quickly. Okay, study. Let us dissect what genetics does on people. And let us dissect what God does on people. Josiah. Come on, wait to the book of 2 Kings. 2 Kings, chapter 22. Some of you know this story quite well. Some of you don't have a clue. Some of you have forgotten. But all of you, I hope, will get a benefit from reading it together with me. 2 Kings chapter 22. Chapter 22. We're going to read verse 1, part of it at least. And it says, Josiah was 8 years old when he became king, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. Full stop. Let's stop there. Wow. Is anybody here 8 years old? No? Maybe in the hall. You have 8 years old in here. I can see. This church usually have heaps of kids. So not, not present, people in the hall, you have eight years old, good on you. There was a king who was eight years old. Nobody should tell you you are too young for serving God. So, what was the genetic makeup of Josiah? That is the family tree of Josiah. This is the ancestry and the people who came after Josiah. And what I would like us to dissect is, according to the Bible, what could be the indicator of genetic material in Josiah's body, in Josiah's brain, in Josiah's mind? Let us start with the great king. So what I'm going to do is, if you can follow that screen, what we're going to do, we're going to talk about this guy. He was, that's the father, that's the, great, that's the grandfather, that's the great-grandfather, King Hezekiah. We'll start with King Hezekiah. And so what we have with King Hezekiah is that the Bible tells us in Isaiah 39 verse 2, New King James Version, that he says that he showed the Babylonians the house of his precious things, the silver and the gold and the spices and the precious ointments and all of the house of his armor and all that was found in his treasures. There was nothing in his house, none in his dominion that Hezekiah showed them not. Inspired writings in the book Patrick's and Prophet tells us that pride and vanity took control over Hezekiah. So there is these people, there is these uh, visitors that came from Mexico to Australia, and the Australians just showed them the Opera House and then and the Story Bridge and what is the bridge in Sydney? I forgot. And that big bridge and all of the beautiful things that men made and collected and and, and did. Instead of saying, hey, you know, come and see what the Lord has done in my life. 
Last time I checked my Bible, and I'm hoping the last time you check your Bible is still there, but my Bible says that those who are proud will be destroyed. In fact, pride is the first and maybe the ultimate steps to lose eternal life when you think about it. Bible continues talking about the great grandfather of, of, of um, Josiah. It says in, in verse 3 to 8 that then say Isaiah the prophet to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days come that all of these house and all of your fathers have, that your fathers have laid up in a store until this day shall be carried to Babylon. And then Hezekiah said, oh, I realize I messed up. Then at the end it says, Then said Hezekiah to Isaiah, Go, Good is the word of the Lord which thou hast spoken. Inspired writings again tell us that he was filled with remorse. But the evil seed, let me, let me actually, I highlight it so you know what I'm reading. It says here that Hezekiah was filled with remorse. But the evil seed had been sown, and in time was to harvest of desolation and woe. His faith was to be severely tried. He was to learn that the only by putting his trust fully in Jehovah could he hope the triumph over the powers of darkness. I hope you don't mind my handwriting or my highlighting or my underlining. I'm not really good, but it's quite hard to be here and do that at the same time. What this Spiraton is saying, you know, that he actually changed, but it was too late. There was a seed that was implanted in the people. I don't know how many of you here who have children would like to see your children go into perdition. I'm sure Hezekiah didn't want that. So let's see what's happened to Hezekiah's son. We're going back to Hezekiah's son, Manasseh. Very quickly, we dissect his life of this son. What the Bible says in Second Chronicles chapter 33, verses 1 to 6 and 9. And I'm only going to read the, the, um, the highlighted part for the sake of time. It says that he was 12 years old when he became king. He reigned 55 years. Wow, the mercy of God. What do you mean, Daniel? Well, let, let's see why. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. Verse 3. He rebuilt the high places which Hezekiah his father had broken down. He raised up the altars for the Baals, made wooden images, worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served them. He built altars in the house of the Lord. He built altars in, of the, of, for all of the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. In the two courts. He caused his sons to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. Practice Susain, witchcraft, sorcery, consulting mediums and spiritists. In, in verse 9, we fast forward, it says, Manasseh seduced Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord has destroyed before the children of Israel. What the Bible is saying is that Hezekiah, not Hezekiah, Manasseh, his son, was an spiritist, a spiritualist, if you want to call it. In my mind, what the Bible is saying is that Manasseh was a Satanist. He was worshipping blandly, openly, Satan. Actually, he wasn't that blunt. We'll see what happens with his son. But he rebuilt, he started to build something that God had commanded the other king, his father, to destroy. He's like, I'm going to build this stuff because the style of worship kind of like appeals to my senses more. In his big camp. <laughs> the genetic disposition was already passed. The seed was passed to this guy. So he became the king leading a nation. Not only himself and his household was messed up, but he's, it says that he led the whole nation. That So much so that they became worse than the people that God said, hey, let's get rid of those people because, because, because they are bad. I imagine here in my mind as I read this verse, it says, So Manasseh seduced Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord has destroyed before the children of Israel. 
Who was before the children of Israel? What I'm reading here is that this guy went ahead and led his people to be worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. For example, amongst many other nations. The Bible says that it would have been better for that guy to tie a rope on his neck, put a massive rock, throw it into the water and drown, because the amount of people that probably lost their salvation as a result of his influence was massive. However, something happened. Let's keep on reading. 2 Kings 21, 16 says that Manasseh shed very much innocent blood till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to the other besides his sin, but which he made Judah sin in doing evil in the sight of the Lord. He just was satanic as satanic can get. He just liked people to, you know, to do, I can imagine them doing these sacrifices, just killing people for the fun of it and self-harming just for the sake of the worship that they were doing to satanic agencies. Bible scholars tells us that Manasseh resorted to satanic agencies employing various types of divination, necromancy. Anybody knows what necromancy is? Communicating to the dead. And sorcery, whereby the powers of evil may known their will and direct, directed the nation's affair. If that doesn't make you scared, I don't know what would. The idea, and you, some of you might be thinking, but that's what's happening today. I don't know, I haven't seen it. I only know what the Bible says. I trust our leaders of the nation are still led somehow, faintly by the Holy Spirit, at some point in time. Otherwise, we'll be gone. But who knows? I'm not here to digest that. What we have in here is that this guy, the prime minister of, Jew, of, of, of this region, of the people of God, was being led by Satan himself. What hope can there be for Josiah? What hope can there be when his great-grandfather was proud, he messed up, and, and so he, see, he planted the seed of, of doomness and pride? And what hope can there be for this guy, or the son of this guy? Interestingly enough, we have some uh, writings in the book Patrick's and Prophets that says that when the prophets of God, this is so interesting, when the prophets of God came to tell Manasseh, hey, dude, you're messed up. You're messing up everybody around you. You need to change. The messages were scorned. Do you know what scorned means? Scorn basically means to refuse something due to pride. Can you think of somebody who was proud? His dad, Hezekiah. The Bible continues on telling us something rather amazing that the Lord allowed for this guy to be captured. And in his captivity, this, a sense came to him that, like, hey, you know, I, I did wrong. And he called unto God. And then the Bible says, and, the Lord, and, and Manasseh then knew that the Lord was good. So he was so satanized, so possessed, that he didn't think that God was good at all. Until then. However, Patrick's and Prophet tells us something cool, or rather sad. Something that proves our point says that repent, this repentance, even though it was remarkable, he came too late to save the kingdom from corrupting influences in the years to come. Many already had stumbled and fallen, and they were never to rise again. Could Josiah be one of such people? You might be thinking, oh, Josiah came later, later. He wasn't even alive. No, these guys had children when they were like kids themselves. He was like 12, 14, 16 years old. They were already having children. Question is, would you like to have a granddad like Josiah's? No. no. Neither would I. I kind of like do have something like that. But nobody would. Nobody would. 
my grandfather. Um, I was totally telling, telling, sharing with you a little bit about me, my family, my ancestry. Both of my grandfathers were high degree Freemason. Now, there were not any Freemasons that just go to the lodge to just do the little thing to be part of a club. My grandfather, paternally speaking, was so embedded into this team. One day, the story tells us, nobody told us this story. It's like physical evidence. We're like, they watch watching this stuff. And there is this big couch that they buy. And he bought this couch, the family, in my, grand, my grandparents' house. And, and, and it was bigger. I mean, they didn't have this idea of bringing a tape and, and measuring to make sure that it goes through the door. So the door wasn't big enough, and the couch was bigger than the door hole. And so as they're pushing, one of my uncles and my grandfather pushing back and forth, and he doesn't come th through, my grandfather goes to, in the name of that one that we don't like, the enemy of God, may this couch go through, and the couch just goes through like butter. Now, I'm not here to glorify what Satan and his angels can do, because if he can do that, my God can do way beyond that. But that is the kind of genetic stuff and environmental stuff that keep people can suffer through. None of you would like to have a grandfather like Manasseh, neither would I. <laughs> None of you, yeah, many of you wouldn't like to have the grandfather that I had. I am pleased to tell you that that grandfather did surrender his life to God a few years before he died. He still had his cognitive capacity and got baptized. My, my, my challenge to you, think, to, to, to you here today is to think that I am assured that none of your grandfathers, not even mine who did that stuff, is as far away from God as Manasseh. So it doesn't matter how your ancestry is gone. What I'm here to say is that I'm sure that your granddad or your great-granddad, uh, he wasn't a murderer. He wasn't sacrificing people and children. He wasn't talking to the dead. Maybe some of you might have done that a little bit. I don't know. It's on your family. But I'm sure they were not just bloodthirsty and communicating with Satan to lead their lives bluntly. His repentance, yeah, I read that, wasn't enough though. And so we come to his son. His son, we're going to go quickly through him because he didn't last too long. Ammon. Ammon was the dad of Josiah. Ammon is this guy, and he was the father of this other guy. What did Ammon do? Let's check it out. The Bible says in 2 Kings, Chapter 21, just before the passage that we were reading, verse 19 to 23, that Ammon was 20 years old when he became king. He reigned two years in Jerusalem, and, the, and, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. As his father Manasseh had done, he walked in the ways that his father walked, served the idol his father served, and worshipped them. He forsook the Lord God of his fathers and did not walk in the way of the Lord. Then the, some people got sick of him, and it says that the servants of his conspired against him and they killed him in his house. That's the reason why he only reigned two years. It is interesting to see what theologians, again, I mentioned to you at the beginning, I'm not a theologian, but theologians who might know what they're talking about, maybe, they talk about this idea below. They said, Ammon seemed to have given all pretense of being a worshiper of Jehovah. He refused to humble himself before the Lord as his father had done and trespassed more and more. What this is saying, and again, this is not inspired stuff, so just take it with a, like, like that, just consider it as some people think, you know, Amon didn't, Amon didn't have any pretenses. What he's saying is that his father, Manasseh, maybe it might look a little bit like he's trying to be with God, but he was really with Satan. This guy said, no, forget about that. We're going to be openly Satanists. We don't have to claim that we're something that we're not. Let's stop sitting in the church of God and coming and then now getting and smoking. Let's come and smoke in the church. Let's drink. Let's dance. Let's party. Let's listen to the wrong music. Watch the wrong movies. Let's read the wrong material. Watch porn in the church. Let's put the projector. We have good sound. That's what he said. That's what he did. As horrible as that sound, that's exactly what was happening. If that horrifies you, I'm thankful for that because that is the degree of sin. 
that genetic makeup can do, can make and lead you to. Patrick's and Prophet says that among those who, who, whose life experience had been shaped beyond recall by the fatal apostasy of Manasseh was his own son. If you doubt that genetics and influence can shape somebody's way of being attractive for wickedness, think twice. I have seen it. We know today that there, is, there are people out there who are addicted for alcoholic and substances. Other substances. And there is a genetic, uh, there is a gene that can be linked to such, such, such uh, addictions and abuses. The question is, how come some do and some don't? So what is Josiah's fate? And I must apologize because I was looking at my screen here and there is a clock and he had 11 something and I'm like, oh, I only been preaching 11 minutes. <laughs> and now it's 12 and I'm thinking, I'm sure that I have more than one minute. So it's the time. So we must finish. Uh, let's just dissect him. Was he, was he, was he prepared? Was he uh, entitled? Was he created? Was he conceived? With the heart of God. Well, I don't know how much you know about science, but science will tell us that he wouldn't be in that line of thought. Even though Spirit of Prophecy says that his heart was led by God, biologically speaking, he was doomed. He was his future, his outlook, even before, even before he actually came to be a king, he was already prepared to actually mess up. His father messed up, his great-grandfather, great -grand his grandfather, and his father did. And every time he was worse. Moses wrote something that God is talking to us about, and it says, I'm not going to read the verses for the sake of time, but these texts are telling us that God visits up to the third and fourth generation of the wickedness of the people. There is Hezekiah. There is Manasseh, that's two. There is uh, Ammon, that's three. Fourth generation, Josiah. And the other text that I have in there, no, I don't have another text. I was going to show you another text, but for the sake of time, we'll move on. But what this is saying is that actually God uh, it does have a judgment to be executing when people are wicked. Paul talked about the people who are wicked. Maybe this is a good liner to talk about this idea because the Spirit of Prophecy says something interesting. To our merciful God, the act of punishment is a strange act, yet He will by no means clear the guilty. Some people today preach, believe, and talk, and even uh, spread the idea that God is so loving, so kind, so merciful, so forgiving, that it doesn't matter what you do, He'll spare you, and you're going to die in your sin, and you're going to go to heaven regardless of. But that's not what the Bible says. That's not what inspired writing says. Does that mean that I'm doomed? Because, you know, I've been trying, Daniel. No, well, I hope that God keeps on finding you trying, and one day he'll find you so converted like Manasseh did. What happened to, no, Manasseh. Yeah, Manasseh. And what happened to Josiah now? Well, point number three, and finishing. Epi epigenetics go beyond genetics. And also it goes beyond past learning. It goes beyond how biologically you are made up as well as how your environment has influenced you. We know that because today we know that Josiah changed. He was the circle breaker. He, 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 was, he, he, he was the one who, who broke the chain on the bonds of genetic sin, of a makeup that pulled that world that Paul was talking about. Hey, you know, I want to do the right thing, but my mind just, he says my body, but yeah, his mind is just pulling him the other way. Don't be fooled thinking Josiah didn't have that problem. 2 Kings 21, 1, 22 1 says that Josiah was only 8 years old. We read that. And then he reigned 31 years. Then if we continue reading though, if we read in, in verse 3 to 11, it says that in, when it came to pass in the 8th year of King Josiah, the king sent Shaphan, the scribe, the son of Azaliah, the son of Meshullah, the, to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to Hilkiah and the high priest that he might count the money. 
which has been brought into the house of the Lord, which the doorkeepers have gathered to the people and let them deliver into the hand of those to doing the work who are overseas in the house of the Lord. Let them give it to, to those who are in the house of the Lord doing the work to repair the damages of the house to the carpenters, to the builders, to the masons, and to timber and, and, to, and hewn stone to repair the house. Basically, they contract like people like Raymond who are well skilled and are experts in building to go and build the house of God again. But this didn't happen naturally. Don't be fooled to think that this happened all of a sudden. We just like to see this guy like a nice guy because we always think of him like a nice guy. But it was a process, even in his young life, to be able to come to that point. How do we know that? Well, let's read the, the other passage in Second Chronicles 34. It says, For in the eighth year of the reign, while he was still young, so he began to seek the God of his father, David. When was that? In the eighth year of his reign so it wasn't until he was 16 years old that he's like oh you know i want to start thinking about what david was talking about obviously he heard about something and what did he do he destroyed all the places and all the images and all the carved wooden stuff and all the iron brass or whatever metal they used to do things to worship so we have in here that in the eighth year of his reign, that was when he was 16, he started to seek God. By 18 years old, he realized his condition. It wasn't a straight away. I bet you, oh, I shouldn't bet because we're Christian, we don't bet, but I can guarantee that between 8 to 16 years of age, he was tussling and turning with this struggle of the flesh as well. And then he was 18, and he started to realize his condition. It was when he was 18 that these people came to read the word of God. And that was the changer. You see, it doesn't matter how messed up your family is or even yourself. I've been messed up myself. When you have the word of God, it changes even your genetics and your predispositions and your desire to do wickedness. And then all of a sudden you desire to do what God wants you to do. And then when he was 20, he started to rebuild the temple. It took four years. Then he realized, hey, you know, we need to rebuild the house of God. The Bible says that when he heard the law of God, he, don't, he didn't only realize his condition, but the condition of the people around him. He realized that he was indeed doomed, and so the people around him, and so he changed because of the word of God. Now, he made a radical change. He put away the idols. He rebuilt the house of God. He, I imagine he started to listen to about more of this word of God. Today, I wonder what is God calling you to do? What is God calling you to put aside, to put away, to get rid of, to destroy, to burn, to dump into the rubbish bin, to dump into the, into the toilet bowl? You might call this fanaticism, ah, Daniel, no, like the Avengers, they're really good. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. It's all fantasy. If you want fantasy, go and read the story of redemption. Not fantasy, real stuff, galactic war. More galactic cannot get. You might call this fanaticism. You might call this foolishness. You might call this intellectual dwarfism because that's against science. I call this a miracle. Because it is indeed a miracle what happened with Josiah. As scientists of human behavior, like myself, there is no way that a guy can be genetically changed just like that. I spend months, years sometimes with people trying to change their, the way they are suffering with their addictions, their depression, their anxiety, their trauma, their whatever. And all of a sudden you're telling me that there is this guy who is all messed up, who has a criminal mind on the making, he just needs to execute it. I don't know what he did between 8 and 16. I'm not saying he did anything wrong, but he probably was warring against his genes. And yet he was changed. He didn't need a psychologist and he didn't need a psychiatrist. How good is that? I call this a miracle that no human mind who chooses to embrace the word of God can go against. You just can't. So he had a, he had a choice to make Faith versus choice. The reality is that faith has not 
and never will overshadow the power given by God for you to choose. I'll say that again. The reality is that faith has not and never will overshadow the power given by God for you to change. The Bible says that after hearing the law of God, Josiah responded, Go and inquire of the Lord for the people and all Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found, so that we can do according to what is written. Josiah's choice was simple. He wanted to know more about God. He wanted to know more about what he needed to do to please God. And the question is here, are you wanting to know more about God and to know what you can do to please Him so that you cannot continue in the vomit that you keep on eating over and over again? We started with that passage when Paul is saying, Oh, wretch of men, I am. What am I going to do? I'm doomed. I'm, I'm messed up. I, there is no way for me to go against my genes. Well, today I'm here to tell you that I'm glad and I'm hoping that you are too, that the message didn't finish there. Because epigenetics, epigenetics was there by, designed by God for us to be able to be transformed and live this spiritual life that He's calling us to live. So at some point in time, this sin has no more attraction for you because proteins in your cell are being modified so that you don't have this attraction for sin, but indeed hate sin. So, he said, and that's what um, Andres read for us in verse chapter 8 of Romans, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And if we fast forward, verses 9 to 11 of Romans chapter 8, it says, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because the sin, but the, because of sin. But the spirit is alive because of righteousness. But it is the spirit of Him who is raised, who raised Jesus from the dead, dwells in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the, His Spirit who dwells in you. If you are thinking here today, Dan, you are talking rubbish. It doesn't make sense. I am here to tell you that that one who resurrected, who brought Christ alive after He died on the cross for you and for your sins can change your genetic makeup. If you think, I cannot stop drinking and smoking, watching pornography, watching movies, listening to the wrong music, doing all this stuff that maybe cheating, stealing, lying, maybe having an affair, maybe doing the wrong thing with your boyfriend and your girlfriend, you know, that's only for marriage. Whatever you're doing, if you are doing that stuff and you are attracted to it, don't, 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 don't feel despair. God is saying, that's the wrong thing to do. But he's also saying, I can change it if you allow me to change it. I resurrected, resurrected my son from the dead. I can can change and I can make those genes to be dead so that genes that are for me are alive. That is what God is saying. And so we finish. And you might have realized that when we read 2 Kings, Kings chapter 22, I skipped verse 2. I did that on purpose. Because the, the verse finishes like this. And he, Josiah that is, was the right was right in the sight of the Lord and he walked in all the ways of his father David and he did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left genetics strongly influences you denying the fact will keep you at disadvantage you need to realize that you are worrying with more than just you know, sometimes it's easy to blame. Satan put the temptation in me. No, sometimes it's right in you. First John chapter 1 says, you know, don't blame people. Don't blame God about your temptations. And I could hear, I'm not defending Satan and his cause. He's messed up. God dealt with him. But let us not blame only him for the things that we do. Sometimes, unfortunately, your mom, your dad, your uncle, your auntie, you, whoever is above you, pass things to you because of the choices. Don't blame them either because somebody above them was doing the same thing. God is offering you freedom. So it doesn't matter if genetics strongly influence you to go against God because epigenetics is part of God's biological plan for your eternal life. In fact, epigenetics goes beyond just your mere genetics. It can change you inside. And it doesn't matter what your environment was. So, 
did you choose for God to kill those genes? Did you choose to be washed? Let's, you know, when I think about these verses of uh, being washed in the blood of the Lamb, did you choose for God to do some washing, to do, to do something with these things that attract you against God? Do you choose to be justified by God? You could, you could keep on playing church. You could keep on dragging your feet in here. You could keep on playing. I've been the elder of this church for the past hundred years. Or my mom and my dad. I was even the child of a pastor. By the way, I was the child of a pastor. Funny enough. But that doesn't mean anything. Maybe one day I share with you my journey. I went backflipped. But God is good and God is graceful. And here I am by the grace of God. And here you are by the same grace. My desire, my prayer is that you choose to avoid just sitting comfortably. Because remember, Christianity is not inherited. Yes, the third and fourth generation, but that choice makes the difference. I hope that you can choose to truly and seriously invest in getting to know more about God, embracing what he calls you to do in his word, the same word that changed this guy who was meant to be doomed, but instead got eternal life through Jesus Christ and the knowledge of what he called him to do in his word. I would like to invite you that if this is your desire, you don't have to stand up. This is probably a bit tricky because usually we call people to stand up. Either way, don't stand up if you don't feel like singing this. We're going to sing a song, uh, something that is relevant to this idea. We're going to sing hymn 318, Whiter Than Snow. As you sing this song, I hope that you can think of the words that God is calling you and I to think of today. It will be, it will be neglectful if I don't... If I don't give an opportunity for you to make a bit of an amendment in your life. So I would like to invite you who is hearing this, who is watching this, who is listening to this, who is here today, that if you know that you are warring against your carnal desire, against your mind, don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to come at the front. We are COVID safe. All I want you to do is as we bow our heads to pray, Tell God that. He knows it, but it is about you verbalizing this. There is something that happens in your mind. Maybe one day we'll talk, have a presentation about what happens when we make decisions in the mind for God. It's something that happens when you say, God, I realize I messed up. I realize that I have something that is warring against, against what you want me to do. I need you to help me because I'm sick of it. If that is you, just pray with me as we seek you in this, as we seek God in this prayer. Father, thank you so much. Um, we praise your name for the grace that you've shown to, to, to Manasseh, who whew, he called you and he knew who you were. I don't know, the story doesn't tell us he made it or he will be in heaven, but I know your mercy and your grace is abundant, and I wouldn't be surprised if we see him there. And then Josiah, thank you for the example. Thank you for allowing us to see that people in the Bible are full of, of, of the same struggles that we have. Father, as we realize our condition here today, some of us might be thinking, oh, I'm reasonably okay. Um, if, if that is the case for somebody, Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit comes and say, you know, you are not okay. You need to be closer to me, even if you're already close. But then there is some of us here who are thinking, oh, Lord, um, yeah, that is me. I come, out of, I come to church, and as soon as I get out, it's going to be a struggle. Father, I pray that you help us, that you give us a double portion of your spirit, that you wash these genes. Father, we're sick of being dogged by this stuff that pulls against us. Father, some of us wake up in the morning and study the Bible, and yet as soon as we finish, we lose it. Help us, Father. We need you. We cannot do it without you. May your spirit work double time in our minds change our genes make this message alive so that when we finish when we leave this place when we say amen we might be not the same we might be more like you more like the way you would like us to be father we pray this not because we deserve it 
But you promise you will listen. And so it is that with that promise we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.